Um, I'm a professor emerita in the School of Nursing. Um, so if you have any questions, um, we'll be uh, circulating with a microphone because this um, presentation is both live and uh, virtual. And um, if, for those people online, um, if you could submit your questions through the Q&A on the um, app, that would be great. Um, and if you could also give your name and organization when you ask the questions. So we have uh, seven presentations and eight speakers. So we're gonna be really strict on time um, because we expect we probably will go over a little bit and uh, with our talks, but just uh, to let you know that we'll try to, our best to, to stay on time. Um, and um, I won't be um, providing a bio for each of the speakers. I'll just be introducing them and uh, their topic. And um, if uh, there's any other questions, um, that would be great. So we'll, uh, we'll get started with our first presentation. And it's by uh, Professor Heather Campbell-Enns. And she's going to be speaking on utilizing dyadic and triadic family interviews to better understand the integrated care needs of older adults. Examples from a Canadian study exploring the needs of older adults at risk of admission to long-term care facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just to start right off, I realized um, this, when I wrote the abstract, this presentation was, was really meant to be about research methods, but now we're in a group talking about um, preventing hospitalizations with older adults. So I'm shifting the title to my subtitle, and that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today. So if you're interested in methods around interviewing and family-based research, then we can talk about that after if you wish. But I think this will be a better fit for the topic. So I will, my name's Heather Campbell Lentz. I am a professor at Canadian Mennonite University in Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, which is, there's a picture of Canada, and Manitoba is the yellow province in the middle, smack in the middle of Canada. We um, are a small population, and this study took place in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is near the southern border. Um, Manitoba is large, even as a small province. Um, it takes about five hours to drive from east to west across the province, and um, it would take me longer to get to the northern part of Canada than it took for me to get here in Europe. So it, it's a large province, and we have a small population. So many of our, I point that out because many of the residents that I'm going to be speaking about have a very rural connection, even though they live in urban areas. And I also want to recognize that this research was done on traditional lands of Indigenous peoples in Canada, of Canada, and we're very grateful for the opportunity to work toward right relationships with our Indigenous partners. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, prevention of long-term care for older adults who would otherwise be uh, able to live in the community longer. And I want to point out a few terminology differences even within this presentation. Mostly I'm speaking about long-term care facilities, which are 24-hour nursing care, highest level of care facilities in Manitoba. Um, some of the slides are going to mention nursing homes. That is uh, another name for these facilities. Um, I'm also going to be referring to assisted living facilities, which are independent living, but they come with services. So someone might purchase meal plans or um, have another service package like housekeeping or recreation services. But it is independent living. The reason we did this study was from this background work. Um, in 2016, colleagues of mine did, um, did a research study and, and filed a report on long-term care nursing home residents in Winnipeg that showed that 10% of people newly admitted to nursing homes had very similar clinical profiles to tenants of assisted living facilities. So what's happening here? Why are people living in highest level of care facility besides the hospital? And when their health is very similar to people who are living independently. What could we find out about this? And we decided it needed to be done through interviews to gather data that we couldn't find otherwise. The purpose of this then was to provide a greater understanding of why these low care, long-term care residents were admitted into long-term care and to uncover what supports they might have needed to stay living in the community longer our research questions were very basic. What factors influence low care residents being admitted to long-term care? What are the facilitators and the barriers for people living in the community? And these low care residents then are residents who 
um, oh, sorry, we had several long-term care facilities involved with recruiting residents in Winnipeg, and they used these metrics that they were already collecting in long-term care. So these were overall well older adults living in their facilities. They uh, could take care of most of their own daily needs. Their cognition was very good. They had little or no concerns around toileting or behavioral problems. And these were the people we were recruiting to the study to ask them, well, okay, why are you living here then? Not in a, <laughs> a judgmental way, but that's what we wanted to know. What is it that brought you to live here? Um, we were then also recruiting knowledgeable family members, those who they concern, considered to be their kin, who could tell them about this experience as well. It didn't need to be um, biological or traditional family members, but almost everybody was either a child or a sibling or a nephew or a niece to these older adults. There were 24 participants, 14 of these were residents. And if we didn't have a resident to participate in the study, then we weren't interviewing family members. We were looking for residents and then building upon that. And from there, we would try to find one and maybe more family members who would also talk to us about what happened and why people were living in long-term care. Um, and this is where the triadic and dyadic interviewing method would, would have come into play. We analyzed the data through thematic analysis. And really, we were looking to find out what was life like before you moved into long-term care, and what was that process like for you? After conducting these interviews with residents and their family members, we found out the basic problem, which will be no surprise to us. The basic problem experienced by residents, as described by them and their family members, was that residents were living alone, and everyone was working to avoid a crisis yet they were experiencing system breakdowns. No surprise to us in this room. So I'm gonna break this up in the next slides, and I apologize for this beta version of a diagram. It's fairly crude, but it kind of does the job. It shows the, it's a description of the pathway these people took to get to long-term care, and what happened so that they, this was their pathway. And, um, and it came with many stories of crises and a lot of sad stories, as well as a few happy ones. Uh, first of all, we've got living alone with increasing concerns. Almost every resident that I talked to was living alone, and if they weren't living alone, they were living in a situation that was not very supportive, like with an abusive spouse, for example. So they were living alone with increasing concerns. They had these physical declines that were happening. They had mental health concerns that were not flagged by the medical system. They had anxiety and depression about their situation, and residents told me stories of suicidality as well. They had, a few of them had substance use problems, all alcohol use problems, and these two were unflagged by the medical system. Then they were working to avoid a crisis, and they had strategies for that. The first strategies they used when uh, they were living alone with increasing concerns was uh, the strategies of family caregiving. Family members stepped in and tried to do their best to caregive. They used community services like meal services or companion services if they couldn't be alone at night. They did look into assisted living faci facilities and to see if that was a better place for them to live, but maybe only one of these residents tried that. Because during that time they found breakdowns with this strategy which you'd see with that in the blue square there. These family caregivers experienced exhaustion and helplessness and financial strain and lack of information that made it very, very difficult to continue as family caregivers. And they found the services and supports in the community were insufficient in their scope, and inflexible, and they were very costly to, to families. And here are a few quotes that family members and residents gave. Um, this first one was a family member who referenced her father, and this was an emotional uh, impact of the work that she was doing as a caregiver and watching him decline. I couldn't live with him not having food, not having care. Like, it was a, tr a tremendous toll. Yeah, tremendous. I know it was a toll on my brother, a toll on my husband, a toll on my dad's siblings, my mom's siblings. Everybody just felt helpless. And another family member referenced her mother who was considering an assisted living facility. This mother was 104 years old and very well. 
and they were critical of the service in assisted living. They had a nurse on Monday to Friday during the day to help. Very minimal assistance. We didn't feel good about it because we thought, what happens in the middle of the night? Like even though they have a call bell and stuff, what happens in the middle of the night? When she's, are they still gonna call 911 and send her to the ER anyway? So the system was breaking down and they used the next strategy, which was managing these breakdowns in the community. And the only way they could manage these breakdowns really was by using the emergency department, bringing their family member to the emergency department and waiting to see what would happen multiple times and also hospitalizations and then sent back home and hospitalizations again. Um, these breakdowns in the health system then included hospital discharge processes um, that were difficult. Discharge um, often came as a surprise to families. They were not involved in the discharge, pr discharge process at an early point, and uh, they were unprepared for discharge. And families felt that there was also problems with geriatric assessments. They didn't look for mental health and addiction problems very often. And overall, they had lack of information about what to do when their older adult was um, discharged from the hospital. And this brought us to a strategy, we called this in the end, was to place their family member in a nursing home or a long-term care facility. Um, this was due to family exhaustion, feelings of helplessness, fear of new crises, lack of support. Here's one longish quote, um, but it's, um, a good example of what happens with families. This is a segment of an interview with uh, a woman who's a daughter of a man who lived in long-term care for several years, longer than people would usually live in long-term care because he was very well there. Um, he had been living with alcohol addiction and the long-term care facility really helped him with that. And then he lived for a long time. But it was very problematic before that. And she said about the hospital, when they were getting ready to release my father the first time from the hospital, what were my options? Who do I turn to in the middle of the night if I'm having problems with this man? He's already done some really wild things to start off with. What happens if this happens again? It's going to happen again. We told the hospital he wasn't ready to go. They released him anyway. Nobody offered us home services for him. There was absolutely no follow-up, absolutely none. You know, we're concerned enough that we think he needs to be hospitalized and we're still concerned. Why do you think it's okay to release him without any kind of support behind it? And once released from the hospital, this family member described feelings of helplessness. He started to de deteriorate quickly again. He's already been discharged once. Like, what's the point of going back to the hospital? We've done that already. So the daughter moved in with him instead. And while he, she was at work, the resident started a fire in his apartment. And the resident and, and all the tenants of the building were evacuated by the firefighters. No one, was, no one died in the fire. It was on his daughter's assistance, insistence that the resident was returned to the hospital via ambulance and was readmitted again. Without a home to return, return to now in the community, he was admitted into a long-term care facility. Otherwise, he would have been homeless. So this last resort strategy is the least desired option for these family members. That's how they talked about it. Um, after people were in long-term care, they didn't talk about long-term care that way, but from the community aspect, they talked about it as last resort. Um, and it had a lot of mixed emotions and feelings. And there's another quote from a resident up here. Um, I, out of time, so I wanna say that um, these residents really had experienced a constellation of concerns. Um, many of these were psychosocial concerns, remained unrecognized by the health system. Um, may be recognized at one point in time, but never carried through in the health system from one provider to another. Um, Long-term care was not chosen willingly, but it was a strategy to be a safe place. Now, after COVID, not everybody would talk about that as a safe place necessarily, but this was just pre-COVID. And the recommendations are all recommendations that we know about that would be considered integrated, uh, a care issues around integrated care. Um, I think another recommendation now would be um, looking, looking at what I've heard the last few days are some of these caring community recommendations too, would really suit um, how we talk about these adults that are living alone in the community. Um, I'll, I'll end there, but I wanna let you know that tomorrow there's a workshop planned to talk about family and family sciences approach to, um, to research and practice, and you're invited to that, and that's where we can talk more about 
uh, family-based methods of research, if you're interested. Thank you for your time. I don't know if there's any time left at all. Thanks, Heather. I think we have time for one question. Any questions? Okay, all right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank oh, sorry, there's one question here. I was wondering if what you're going to do with the... Uh, mm -hmm. No, not the results, the unbefailing and the... Re uh, Recommendations. recommendations. Are you going to implement them and follow? Well, follow as a researcher, I can't implement them, but I have given a report to provincial government, and it's probably sitting on a shelf <laughs> there, but it's there for them, and it was widely widely um, spread throughout the long-term care facilities too, so it's definitely been a point of awareness raising, and um, in small pockets community pockets, some implementation happening of, of some very easy, like the easiest recommendations, yeah. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, Thank you. Research. Excellent work. Thanks, Thanks Heather. Question. Okay, so our next speaker um, is Kazu, um, and that's all I can pronounce, so. <laughs> um, and he is going to be speaking on development of a care management support system for preventing severe disease in elderly people requiring long-term care and enabling their continued living at home. Results of a questionnaire survey to identify assessment items. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Kazutoshi Furukawa from Toyo University in Japan. Our research group is uh, conducting a research project called Development of a Care Management Support System for Preventing Severe Disease in Elderly People Requiring Long-Term Care and Enabling Them to Continue to Live at Home over a three-year period from 2022 to 2024. Today, I'd like to share with you the first result of this research project, result of a questionnaire to identify assessment items. Since this is first time meeting you all, let me, let me, let me first tell you a little about myself. <clears throat> I have four national certifications, registered physical therapist, certified care manager, certified social worker, and certified care worker. <clears throat> I worked in the medical and social work field about eight years before becoming a university faculty member. Currently, I am collaborating with researchers in information technology and care management on the study of what I am about to report today. <clears throat> First, let me discuss the background of this study. In Japan, it is common for individual elderly patients requiring long-term care to use multiple home care services. Patients' conditions at the time of care are not shared among the service providers. Developing a website that collectively manages care information predicts decline in activities of daily living, or ADL, based on AI analysis, and if necessary, automatically sends report to service providers and the care manager in charge of patients. This figure shows the overall picture of our project. As an example, this figure shows a case in which an elderly person in need of care uses three services, home care service, daycare center, and home rehabilitation. When each service is provided, Necessary information is entered into the application and stored in the database section on the cloud. Since the amount of information is enormous, the information is analyzed by AI, and when the decline in the ADL is predicted, the system alerts the care manager in charge of a patient. Upon receiving an alert, the care manager will issue instructions to the patient and service providers to prevent ADL decline through early intervention. <clears throat> what I am reporting today are the results of the first survey conducted as part of this project. In Japan, 
The Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare, or MHLW, has provided assessment and monitoring items regarding care management, but the number of items is enormous. Therefore, the purpose of this study is to examine the necessary monitoring items for the development of this system. Subject and method. 1,000 in-home care support offices were randomly selected from across the country, and three questionnaires were mailed to each for a total of 3,000 care managers. First, we examined the assessment and monitoring items indicated by the MHLW, specifically I, my co-researcher, and care managers who were not included in this study held discussions and selected 73 items. For each of these 73 items, we asked the question using a five-question method. The response options were, one, not important at all, two, not very important, three, undecided, four, very important, and five, very important. Furthermore, in order to ask about items that were considered urgent to intervene in terms of preventing users' ADL decline, we selected 18 more items from the 73 items extracted earlier. From these 18 items, we asked the users to rank the items in order to priority from one to five that are considered necessary for an urgent intervention. The analysis method was simple tabulation for each question items. And after that, the analysis was then performed by AI or machine learning. The analysis by AI used the data obtained from the 73 monitoring items as features, and clustering analysis was performed to analyze the characteristics of each cluster. The cluster analysis by AI was performed in Python using the k-prototype method. Result, these items which a mean value of 4.7 or higher were change in daily condition, presence of falls, status of cognitive impairment, complaints from the individual or the person, mental and physical status of a family member, and complaints from the caregiver or family member. The following are the results of machine learning analysis by AI. Look at this slide. The vertical axis was set as a degree of agreement with the question, so that the higher the value shown in the histogram, the more significant questions were considered. As a result, we were able to classify the respondents into three clusters. As we, more, uh, as we move from cluster zero to cluster two, the affirmation becomes stronger throughout the question. Cluster zero has relatively more experience as a care support specialist and a higher percentage of managers and chief care support specialists. In cluster two, more than half of the respondents have less than 10 years of experience as a care support specialist, and the proportion of managers and chief care support specialists is low. The data of cluster one falls between that of cluster zero and cluster two. It can be inferred that the respondents are in the process of gaining experience and transitioning from cluster two while they are in the process of gaining experience to cluster zero where they have relatively more experience. It can be interpreted this way. First, regardless of cluster, the sum of status of cognitive impairment, or item one, shown in the dark blue, and presence of false, or item two, shown in the light blue, 
accountant for more than half of the response. Furthermore, as shown by the solid blue line, the percentage of these increase when looking from cluster zero to cluster two. On the other hand, for physical and mental condition of the caregiver or family member, item 17 showing the gray, the trend is as shown by the dashed black line, with cluster zero having the highest percentage at 12.3% and cluster two having the lowest percentage at 3.4%. This was a very interesting result. In this survey, we found that the importance of caregivers or family members' physical and mental condition increases as the care manager gains more work experience. We believe that this is because there are many cases in which the deterioration of the caregiver's physical and the mental condition is a major cause of the decline in the user's own ADL, and that as such experience as is gained, awareness of the importance of the caregiver's physical and mental conditions many increases. Therefore, we believe that this is one of the important monitoring items. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kazoo. We have about four minutes for questions. Any questions? No questions online, any questions? There's one back here. Thank you for your presentation, it was very enlightening. I'm wondering if you're now gonna use this model to um, look at data to predict ADL decline to see if it's actually impactful or whether or not it's thought to be impactful by um, clinicians but doesn't actually predict ADL decline. Sorry if I talk to you fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry, I couldn't understand your question. Okay. So, so please send the application of the ICIC and the live questions. So, I will reply as soon as possible. Okay. No so, problem, thank you. <laughs> okay, so you're saying you'd like her to, she, you would like her to post the question on the Q&A? Okay, thanks. Any other? Okay, well thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so our next presenter is Eileen Crows and she'll be speaking on engaging health prof care professionals in refining the target group of a new care type, the Acute Geriatric Community Hospital Referral Decision Study. Thank thanks. you. That's a long, oh, thanks, that's a long title. <laughs> now I don't have to pronounce it again. Um, so welcome, great that you're attending this session, and I'm very honored uh, to get the chance to tell you more about our recent study, and it's about refining the admission criteria of a new intermediate care model in the Netherlands. And we did that uh, with the use of a qualitative study with case vignettes. Uh, and I'm Elina Kruse, I'm a PhD student at the Amsterdam uh, University Medical Center. And so today I will answer five questions together. Uh, yeah, not together, I will try to answer five questions for you. And the first one is why refine the mission criteria of an intermediate care model or intermediate care models when more care is moved from the hospital to the community? And the second one is how can case vignette methodologies be useful during this process? And then I will explain what the main differences are between the target patient groups of the acute geriatric community hospital, so the new intermediate care model that we are researching, and other intermediate care models in the Netherlands, uh, and those are geriatric refladation and short-term residential stay and the differences between the target group of the acute geriatric community hospital and traditional uh, hospital care, geriatric hospital care. 
And then I will show you the refined uh, admission criteria which we created as a result of this study. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I will tell you more about the considerations that healthcare professionals take into account during referral decision making to follow up care. Uh, but first some background, because as we all know, um, from research, most older people prefer to age in place. And a lot of uh, countries around the world are also implementing policies to, um, to make this possible to age in place. And uh, also in Europe, there's a trend to mo uh, move more care from the hospital to the community. And there are also policies implemented. However, experts uh, suggest that this, this can also increase the burden on hospital care as um, older people living in a community are more at risk of hospital admissions than older people living in a residential setting. And when older people are admitted to the hospital, research also shows that they have higher risk of experiencing adverse health outcomes like mortality, uh, disability, uh, or readmissions. And that's why also in a lot of countries they're implementing intermediate care models in order to avoid these negative outcomes of hospitalization for older adults, uh, but also to support older adults to stay longer at home. Um, so let's move now to the D Dutch uh, context. Um, in the Netherlands, um, there was an um, increase, uh, there were rising expenses in long-term care. And this led also to the reform of the healthcare system in 2015, and uh, with a shift to more to the non-residential setting. So shifting long-term care to the non-residential setting, to, so to the home setting. Um, and first, also stricter criteria was set uh, for admission to long-term care. So now uh, people are only admitted when they uh, require 24-7 long-term care. And in 2015, uh, also a new intermediate care model was implemented. This uh, model is called short-term residential stay. And this was the second bed-based intermediate care model next to geriatric revalidation, which was already there. And recently, uh, also a new model uh, was implemented, a third model, and this is the Acute Geriatric Community Hospital. And this is intermediate care for all the patients with an acute care need. And short-term residential stay is a short-term, uh, bed-based, intermediate care, a lot of uh, terms I know, for people with uh, generic health needs, uh, so not hospital need. And uh, these patients for short-term residential stay uh, should, yeah, are not admitted to the hospital. They don't require hospital care, but uh, can also not uh, go home. So that's why this uh, model uh, exists. And also traditional geriatric hospital wards exist. Now a bit more about the acute geriatric community uh, hospital model. Um, I'll try to explain it shortly. In, um, we designed it based on four core components, and these are all evidence-based. So the care provided in the acute geriatric community hospital is acute specialized care, so hospital care, and it's provided in the community, so in a facility in the community. And care is focused on rehabilitation and return home. So already in the acute phase, they start with uh, early rehabilitation. And then the care provider is also integrated care, so it's uh, transmural and close to home. And it's provided in a fitting environment for all the people uh, in order to prevent delirium, uh, but also functional decline. Um, so uh, now one uh, uh, acute geriatric community hospital exists in the Netherlands. And uh, it's now added as a new model also to try to implement it in other regions in the Netherlands. But um, uh, when the short-term residential stay was implemented, and uh, there were no, um, so I will, uh, I will try to tell you more about the patient groups now. So when short-term residential stay was implemented, there were no initial guidelines or specific guidelines about the patient groups uh, which should be admitted. And also for the acute geriatric community hospital in Amsterdam, uh, initial admission criteria were created but healthcare professionals and uh, uh, also policymakers indicated last year that these did not uh, give enough guidance uh, about the patient group. And this led um, 
this leads to variation in referral decision outcomes. That is what we noticed, that in different regions, uh, the patients at the emergency department uh, were referred to, uh, yeah, in a different, to different care models, that it was different per healthcare professional and per region where someone was admitted to. Um, and to ensure, um, to ensure that a referral decision making is done right and that the patients receive the right care at the right place so that they are referred to the right place. Uh, the aim of this study was to refine the admission criteria um, for the acute uh, geriatric community hospital in order to also get a clear distinction between the target group of the acute geriatric community hospital and the other geriatric uh, models. So uh, we carried out a study, uh, a qualitative study with case vignettes uh, consisting of three phases. In the first phase, we collected case vignettes uh, from clinical practice. And in the second phase, uh, we uh, let the, these clinical uh, case vignettes, uh, with, we let them review by healthcare professionals. And uh, we did it by means, of a, by means of a survey. So they made referral decisions for these case vignettes in the survey and also reported their considerations. And uh, at last, we uh, also carried out focus groups in which we further refined the mission criteria and further clarified the boundaries with the other care models. I will not go into detail about the data analysis, uh, but we used coding, inductive, and deductive coding. And once the article is published, <laughs> the figure will also be available, uh, which describes the whole process. Uh, of the target refinement process we followed. Uh, in total, 20 healthcare professionals participated, uh, 10 from the hospital setting and 10 from the intermediate care setting, and all were uh, also involved in implementing the new care model, so the acute geriatric community hospital in their region. Um, yeah, so the first finding, let's go to the results. The first finding is about uh, the difference between the target group of the acute geriatric community hospital and the traditional admission to a geriatric hospital ward or hospital care. And in short, uh, the difference, um, yeah, so the, at the traditional geriatric hospital ward, the medical specialist is in charge, so the geriatrician. And at the acute geriatric community hospital, uh, this can also be the elderly care physician or the a nursing home physician, we also call uh, the person, yeah, it's the two for the same uh, profession, it's two the same names. And um, uh, the nurse specialist or the physician assistant can also be in charge. But at the new model, the medical specialist is always actively involved. So maybe he or she is not respo responsible, but he or she is involved. And the main finding is that with regards to the difference in the target groups between both uh, models, is that uh, the main difference is the complexity of the medical specialist care need of the patients. Um, and complexity uh, was defined uh, as when the patient is not uh, hemodynamically stable, and this is too complex, for example, for the acute geriatric community hospital, and that's why this patient should be admitted to the traditional hospital ward. But complexity can also be that uh, complex diagnostics, diagnostics are needed to formulate a treatment plan or when high intensity monitoring is needed. So then uh, next we uh, clarified boundaries between medical generalist care, uh, between the acute geriatric community hospital and the other intermediate care models that already exist. And in short, the main finding is that the difference has to do with the indication. So uh, for uh, the acute geriatric community hospital, the patient needs to have a medical specialist care need and the clinician should be involved or responsible, the geriatrician, uh, so the medical specialist. And for the other intermediate care models, uh, the GP or the nursing home physician can also be responsible. So that's the difference in, in indication. And this is too much to explain today. Uh, I don't have time for that, but uh, we refined the admission criteria for the new care model. And some are in new additions uh, that were created together, co-created also with other healthcare professionals. But some are also reformulations uh, of the initial admission criteria for the uh, acute geriatric community hospital in Amsterdam. 
So for, exam so for example, uh, no need for complex, uh, complex diagnostic testing uh, was reformulated into the diagnosis and treatment plan uh, are clear. Uh, but what we also found uh, during this study is that um, referral decision making is not only a matter of checking off admission criteria. Now, healthcare professionals take a lot of factors into account during uh, referral decision making. And these can be provided or uh, divided into clinical and organizational triage factors. And based on all of the, based on weighing the clinical triage factors, uh, healthcare professionals uh, make uh, a decision on the optimal referral decision, but sometimes, a lot of times actually in the Netherlands, this is not uh, logistically or practically not possible. And that's when they uh, decide to, yeah, to choose the next best option. So back to the, the, uh, the questions, and I hope the answers, and that they're also clear for you. So first, refining the admission criteria of intermediate care models is crucial when more care is moved from the hospital to the community. And case vignette methodologies are a valid, reliable, inexpensive, and practical tool to refine the target groups of care models or intermediate care models. And the main differences between the acute geriatric community hospitals and geriatric care models, yeah, I explained them, but in, yeah, in short, uh, between uh, acute geriatric community hospital and the other intermediate care models, it's the indi indication so the medical specialist indication versus the medical generalist indication. And the main difference is difference between the acute geriatric community hospital and the traditional hospital ward has to do with the complexity of the medical specialist care provided. Um, then we reformulated the admission criteria, the 12 uh, uh, admission criteria, and they provide, hopefully provide more guidance. That's also what healthcare professionals indicate but developing an overarching triage instrument for all geriatric care models and intermediate care models in the Netherlands could f further support uh, healthcare professionals at the emergency department. And uh, beyond admission criteria, uh, referral decision making involves a complex interplay that's what we found between those clinical and organizational triage factors. And yeah, it's just not a matter of only checking off the admission criteria. So yeah, that's, our study, what we found, a lot of different kind of results and uh, really practice-based, uh, but I hope you found it interesting and I'm happy to answer your questions if you have them. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eileen, that was very interesting. We have time for one question. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the very nice presentation. Towards the end, you talked about the other factors that uh, clinicians might take into account, and you talked about organizational, but I just wonder about families and other caregivers. Is that captured under social and the clinical factors, or do they, uh, yeah, the slide before that, uh, I think. Let me see. Yeah, the family and other caregivers, yeah, maybe we, we we didn't see them in the, our data, but I can imagine that is a factor too, that they uh, have an influence also on the referral decision that is ultimately made. Um, so that's, a, yeah, we didn't see them in our data, but maybe we can uh, categorize them under patient preferences, but then rename it. <laughs> that's a good idea, maybe in preferences overall, and that is also influenced by the preference of the family, of course. But yeah, I didn't uh, see them in my own data, those considerations, so that's why they're not included here. But that's a good addition, I think. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again, Aileen. Yeah. That's my turn. <laughs> So on behalf of our research team, I'm really pleased to present the results of our study that evaluated the implementation and effectiveness of a new transitional care stroke intervention. And I'd like to just acknowledge the um, research team, many of whom are here at the conference. Um, and uh, next, I'd like to acknowledge our funding uh, that we received through the Canadian Institute of Health Research as well as my uh, Canada Research Chair in Person-Centered Interventions. 
So we had two objectives for this study. Um, and the first objective was to examine the effectiveness of a new transitional care stroke intervention compared to usual stroke care on both health outcomes and costs. And our second objective was to examine how to best implement the TCSI intervention. And I just want to think it's important to mention that we conducted this study during COVID, uh, during the height of COVID actually. It was initiated seven months after the COVID um, pandemic was announced in December of 2020. And this had significant implications for the design, implementation, and evaluation of our study that I will talk about later. So the next um, thing I want to just clarify is how we define transitions. And in our study, we define transitions as the movement of people across various healthcare locations, settings, and providers. And that includes working with persons with stroke, their family caregivers, to establish and implement a transition plan that includes goal setting and the flexibility to respond to evolving needs. And this was taken from the Canadian Stroke Best Practice Recommendations. So just by background, um, we know that there have been significant improvements in hyperacute and acute stroke care over the last decades. And this has contributed to a population-wide decline in mortality, uh, in stroke-related mortality. But despite these improvements, um, the burden of stroke is increasing, especially in the post-acute phase, which occurs uh, predominantly in the community, because about up to 68% of older adults, defined as those 55 years and over, are, direct, are discharged directly home from hospitalization. And about 60% of these individuals will require rehabilitation in the community. We know that these um, older adults are receiving um, care from multiple providers across multiple settings and sectors. And, and we know that navigating the transition between hospital and home is associated with very uh, substantial stress and, and psychosocial and health-related challenges. Also, we know about uh, the median number of transitions after discharge from acute care is three. So we know that people are making up to at least three transitions after discharge, but some have up to seven transitions post-stroke. Um, we know also that there are deficiencies in the quality of transitions, um, and there are significant evidence gaps in regarding stroke care transitions, particularly in that there's very little known about the um, uh, transitional care needs or solutions to address uh, the needs and gaps in transitional care for older adults with stroke and multimorbidity. So our, what can be done? Um, so what we did was we developed and evaluated a standardized uh, model of stroke uh, care, uh, transitional care. And what we need is a standardized, effective, equitable, scalable, and adaptable transitional care model to really ex um, improve the experience and the quality of transitions across the care continuum for persons with stroke and their care partners. And one stroke such model is the transitional care stroke model that we developed. So the overall goal of this model, um, what it was a six month integrated and patient oriented intervention that was designed to improve the quality and experience of transitions from hospital to home um, for older adults with multimorbidity. They, it consisted of six components. Uh, the first component was the development of a standardized comprehensive discharge plan using what we call the patient-oriented discharge summary that was being used across uh, several hospitals. Um, a post-discharge telephone call was made by the care coordinator to assess patients and to triage them with respect to their needs. The interprofessional team offered up to six virtual visits to uh, individuals where they uh, did a comprehensive assessment using standardized tools and carried out um, health promotion, stroke uh, rehabilitation uh, interventions that are based on evidence. Um, we had a designated care coordinator who was also as defined as a system navigator who led the interprofessional team and led the team in the development of a care plan as well as uh, assumed a primary role 
in linking uh, participants and their caregivers to health and social services supports. As well, uh, the team conducted monthly case conferences, and um, during those case conferences, they developed a single plan of care uh, for each patient. The TCSI intervention was delivered by an interprofessional team that consisted of a nurse, uh, a registered nurse, a social worker, occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, and social worker. So it was a very complex intervention. So this study uh, was a, ran a pragmatic randomized control trial. Uh, what that essentially means is that, is that the intervention was uh, delivered and evaluated in the usual care setting with the usual providers. Um, and it involved two sites in Ontario. And uh, it, what we essentially did was we screened people for their eligibility and then randomly assigned them to either receive the transitional care intervention plus usual stroke care or usual stroke care alone. And then we evaluated their outcomes, the change in their outcomes with respect to health and costs and use of services at six months. So the eligibility criteria in order to be eligible for the study, they had to be 55 years of age and over, hospitalized for a stroke within the last year, had two or more chronic or comorbid conditions, discharge to the community but not hospital or long-term care, referred to outpatient stroke rehabilitation. Because it was a virtual intervention, they had to have access to a phone or other device. They had to live within the geographic boundaries of the outpatient clinics that we were, uh, were delivering the intervention, mentally competent to give informed consent or had a substitute decision maker so that we could include um, people with cognitive impairment and as well had um, understanding English or had a translator. So our outcome, primary outcome for the study was the risk of hospital readmission for any cause after six months. And our second out uh, outcomes included uh, the number of hospital stays and readmissions, the number of, of emergency department visits, the use and costs of various health and social services, physical and mental health functioning, stroke self-management, patient experience, and depressive symptoms. So we used um, a selection of standardized, reliable, and valid tools uh, to measure these outcomes at baseline and then again at six months. In terms of methods um, for our effectiveness analysis, we looked at the relative risk for hospital and ED visits um, and the analysis of covariance for other outcomes. And we also used multiple imputation uh, for missing data. For implementation, we, had, we conducted two focus groups with the providers that were delivering the intervention, which included tw up to 12 um, providers across the two sites, so we did two focus groups. We also met with the teams on a monthly basis and uh, collected data there as well on implementation. So this diagram, although busy, um, it provides a summary of the uh, flow through the trial. And so a total of 182 uh, older adults were, were screened for the study, and 91% met all of the eligibility criteria. And out of that 54% uh, um, eligible older adults consented and entered the trial, and of the 90 participants, 79 completed the six-month follow-up. So we had a re retention rate of about 88%, which is quite good given the population. And of the 44 um, participants who were um, assigned to the intervention, 93% received at least one visit by the team. So the engagement rate was, over, was quite high. And those 41 participants who received um, the intervention received an average of five visits over the six month period. So in terms of baseline characteristics, um, which confirm, I think these baseline can, characters can confirm that we've reached our target sample. Uh, the majority were male. Uh, they were an average of 70 years of age. Um, over, over three quarter had experienced their first ever stroke. Um, they had an average of seven chronic conditions in addition to their stroke. And 27% had three or more risk factors for stroke, like uh, inactivity, physical inactivity, stress, obesity, et cetera. Um, over 25%, uh, so about a quarter of the sample, had depressive symptoms. 
um, almost half lived alone, and 46% had an annual income of less than $60,000 per year. So in terms of results, um, our, again, our primary outcome was the risk of hospitalization, and we found that there was no group difference in the risk of hospitalization, so no difference between the two groups with respect to hospitalization, and no group difference with respect to the length of stay in hospital. And you can see um, the number of hospitalizations during the six-month period was quite low, actually three hospitalizations uh, with lengths of stay ranging from one to seven days in the intervention and only five in the um, control group. In terms of uh, secondary outcome in emergency department visits, there was no group difference in the risk of emergency department visits. And again, um, the number of emergency department visits was quite low in both the intervention and the control group. So this slide um, shows basically the difference between the intervention and control group with respect to the change in health-related quality of life from baseline to the six-month follow-up. And basically what we see here is that the square represents the mean difference and the line represents the confidence in interval for that difference. And you can see that most of the outcomes are on the right-hand side of the diagram, which favors the intervention. And those lines that are not touching the um, vertical line are consist considered to be significant. So you can see that there were significant group differences in favor of the intervention in overall physical functioning, as well as three subscales within that domain, which were physical functioning and rural functioning related to physical health and, mortal and uh, vitality. So in other words, participants receiving the intervention reported greater improvements in these areas compared to those receiving usual care. So again, um, secondary outcomes. This slide, again, shows the difference between the intervention and control groups in the change in stroke self-management and depressive symptoms and patient experience. And you could see again that there were significant group differences in favor of the intervention for stroke self-management and patient experience. With respect to cost, um, there was no difference between the two groups in cost. So the cost of use of health services was the same between the two groups overall. But there were some significant differences, whereas home care costs were lower in the intervention group and uh, stroke care costs were higher in the um, intervention group um, by virtue of the intervention itself. So in terms of facilitators, and briefly, um, the main facilitators that were reported by the team um, were, the number one was having a dedicated care coordinator and system navigator. That was, that was a really critical component of the intervention and um, the care coordinator navigator was able to um, lead the team and navigate through all the various challenges that were presented during the study, particularly related to COVID. The use of SharePoint, we use SharePoint by the interprofessional team um, to communicate and share virtually. Um, virtual care delivery was a facilitator. We were uh, mandated to use virtual care uh, during this study because it was in the height of the pandemic, but it was actually a facilitator for many people. Um, use of standardized clinical assessment tools, facilitated discussion with the interprofessional team, and also screening and alerts uh, facilitated communication and information sharing uh, within the team as well as with the, between the team and primary care. So in terms of barriers, um, virtual care delivery, while it was a facilitator, there were also a number of barriers, and I won't have time today to go through all of them, but um, it also, also there were barriers, technological barriers, et cetera, related to virtual care. Um, re there was redeployment of um, staff members during the intervention period, uh, which created several challenges and also reduced the um, uh, access to, reduced access at certain points in the study to certain members of the team because they were redeployed to other areas. Um, information and sh sharing and communication was also challenging because the team had to get used to communicating with each other virtually as well as communicating with patients virtually. But these were not issues uh, that were specific to the intervention. These were also challenges that the, the usual care team was, was uh, experiencing. And certainly there were some challenges accessing community programs and services because 
of the pandemic, uh, some of the services had to shift to, most of them actually shifted virtual or they had to change their criteria for eligibility as a result of that virtual care delivery shift. So in terms of research impacts, um, the result, this research has already resulted in a number of impacts at both the local and provincial level. Um, as a result of the study, um, the, uh, one of the sites has actually created a care coordinator navigator position and um, has also introduced a registered nurse and social worker to the outpatient team. Um, one of the sites is also using uh, the alerts to improve communication with primary care. Um, this post-discharge follow-up uh, call to patients waiting for admission was also something that, they, that the sites implemented to help to uh, triage their patients and manage the wait list. Uh, use of SharePoint was also uh, something they continued to use. We, continue, we used um, a website, we developed and used a website called My Stroke Recovery Journey, and that's uh, been adopted by our regional uh, stroke network as part of their usual practice. We've learned a lot about virtual care, and um, the last thing is that there's clear alignment between this study and what our findings and a provincial community stroke rehab initiative that is currently going on. And so um, in terms of next steps, in summary, uh, we hope to uh, conduct another trial to evaluate the implementation and effectiveness of the transitional care stroke intervention in other diverse settings. As well, um, we, a scalability assessment is planned, uh, led by Dr. Melissa Northwood, and um, funded through Ontario Health to look at um, the scalability of the uh, TCSI in diverse settings in Ontario and Canada. And I have a number of references, and thank you. <laughs> And I'm not a very good role model because I think I'm out of time. Is that right? <laughs> Unless someone has one burning question. Yes. That's okay. Hello? Yes, yeah, good. good. Yeah. Uh, two questions, which should be quick. Are these hemorrhagic or thrombotic strokes both. that you both. were Any both? Stroke. Yes. And did they fit the six hour window or whatever the window is now for uh, you know uh, transport to the stroke center? I'm just wondering if some of this is because they didn't get there soon enough or? Okay, so the, our intervention started once they were discharged home. Okay, from right. The so we don't know the what the original no, okay. so we, we, our criteria was any stroke, any type of stroke, at any severity as well. Thanks, Maureen, yeah. super interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna move over here now. <laughs> Let my... Okay. So our next, we have two speakers for the next <laughs> session. We have Joe Padula and Jen Recknagel. Recknagel? Recknagel, sorry. And they're, they're going to be co-presenting on Seniors Designing for Seniors, how University Health Network's NORC Innovation Center is creating an integrated health and social care community for seniors residing in naturally occurring retirement communities. Well, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Do you want me to uh, and thank you everyone uh, for the opportunity to come here today to speak with you. Uh, so many great presentations, my mind is just blown, I don't know about everyone else. Um, but first, I guess just to say my name is Jen Recknagel, I'm the Director of Innovation and Design and this is Joe Padula, Senior Program Manager and we're here from the NORC Innovation Centre, which is part of the University Health Network in Toronto. Uh, and we're here to talk to you today about working in and with community to develop an integrated model of health and social care to better support aging in place in NORCs. So first, I'll back up for context. I'm sure many of you already know, uh, but uh, really just, you know, what is the difference between NORCs and NORC programs? Um, 
many of you probably know, but NORC stands for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. Uh, and this really is just a geographic designation. It was coined in the 1980s to describe an area, uh, such as a neighborhood or a building, that, that has a high density of older adults. NORC programs, on the other hand, leverage this natural, de natural density to provide a range of health and social services. Um, as part of our research at the NORC Center, we've been looking at census da data in Canada that shows trends uh, towards increased urbanization amongst older adults, as well as increased living in high-rise buildings. Um, and these buildings can be referred to as naturally occurring retirement communities. Uh, they're not retirement homes, they're not long-term care, they're not purpose-built for older adults, they're just regular apartments, condos, and co-ops uh, that just so happens to have a high density. <coughs> and in this case, uh, we've defined that as 30% residents over the age of 65. So really important to note that these NORC buildings are inherently intergenerational, uh, which is something, of course, we've heard from the community of older adults uh, hoping to stay in intergenerational communities. Uh, so the map up here is actually a, a map of Toronto. Um, we've been mapping for uh, all over the province of Ontario and Toronto where the NORC buildings are. Uh, and in Toronto alone, there's almost 500 buildings that qualify as a NORC, accounting for 70,000 seniors. Uh, and in our province of Ontario, there are more adults living in naturally occurring retirement community buildings than in long-term care and retirement homes combined. So there really is, uh, from a population health perspective, uh, a very major and untapped opportunity to reshape how and where we care for older adults who want to age in place. Uh, I'm, I'm tasked with talking a little bit about our approach uh, to participatory design. My background is actually as a human-centered designer, so I'm a little bit of a fish out of water here amongst all these, I, I call real researchers. <laughs> uh, but how, we, uh, how are we working with older adults to design a NORC model? Uh, we are taking a participatory design approach, and for us that's not just a nice to have, but it's actually an essential ingredient to developing services and solutions that actually meet the needs of communities. Um, so we've Im embedded various different methods uh, and co-design processes throughout our model, from the development and discovery phase all the way through implementation and continuous iteration once our, our programs are up and running. So this includes steps uh, that to develop deep understanding of context, needs, goals, includes, of course, one-on-one -on -one interviews, but also ethnographic observations, uh, storytelling projects, user journeys, uh, as well as multiple rounds of co-design uh, to prototype and refine our models. Um, there's not enough time here today to go into all of the different methods, so perhaps it's kind of best uh, summed up by, by an approach that's borrowed from the design research canon, which is really the idea of designing for extreme users. So, you know, instead of looking at data and looking at where is the average, uh, we look specifically for use cases at the extreme. So in the case of older adults, we look for and are looking to co-design with healthier, perhaps younger Zoomers. Uh, and then on the other hand, those with multiple chronic conditions, perhaps accessibility barriers. And so when you design for the extremes, you capture everyone in between. And this is kind of part of the, a universal design approach. Uh, so quickly, quick, quickly, what we heard, uh, I'm sure this is common to, to, many, to many different projects for those working in the community with older adults. Um, a focus on community building as a first step is essential to the way that we are working. Uh, we've learned that neighbors can be a primary source of support for both emotional and instrumental support, that relationships matter, uh, that building strong relationships over time can increase the chances that older adults are more likely to reach out for support before there's an emergency. Um, of course, access remains an issue. Uh, a lot of people know what they need, but they don't know where to get it or how to get it. And then when they do, they often have to go through multiple points of entry in, in order to get that support. 
Uh, Self-determination, having active choice in making decisions about one's life as an older adult is a key ingredient to maintaining the vitality needed to stay living independent when the body breaks down, when things become harder, uh, when people stop, start talking over you and through you and decisions are made for you, uh, things uh, really become very difficult. And uh, yeah, that sense of vitality uh, and being active participant in one's own life is something we heard a lot about. Uh, and then the last one is one that I, I like to specifically identify because it's very common here in this community, uh, but in the, in the hospital network where we work, we don't often talk about baking in a sense of belonging into the way we deliver care. Uh, but we've learned you know, that doing things together creates a sense of meaning and mattering and purpose, and that for older adults in the community, we need to design experiences that provide a venue for this to occur in order for relationships to be built, for access to happen and, and whatnot. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to my colleague, Joe, who's gonna talk a bit more about how we've answered these needs uh, and through our design process and developing a new NORC model at the University Health Network. Thanks, Jen. So I'll spend the last uh, three and a half minutes or so talking about uh, talking about these. So we currently, the Nork Innovation Centre has actually seven teams working on multiple levels to develop a model of care uh, for what adds up to about 4,000 older adults across 20 buildings at this point in time. Um, and um, part of this, foundational piece of this, is our ambassador program which forms the foundation for every model or version of our model that we have. So in the ambassador program, we work alongside uh, older adults using a participatory design approach that Jen described, uh, uh, where they're able to choose what matters to them and what they need in their particular community. So every community is very unique and personalized to their needs. Uh, some examples of the services that they've asked for and we've been able to uh, help them get is uh, health-related talks for things such as fraud prevention or cooking for one, uh, drop-in exercise programs to help uh, encourage social mingling and reduce isolation as well as fitness, uh, digital literacy, social activities such as coffee side chats, uh, group health clinics such as vaccine delivery or chiropathy services and so on. Our role at UHN is just to act as a catalyst where we bring people together in the community, uh, connect them to local partners that we may be aware of if they're not able to find their own, and build capacity to grow a local community-led leadership. Um, in the next slide, this is a very highly simplified schematic of where we, we've evolved since the ambassador program. So we went back to our community of partners to create the integrated health and social care model that you see a uh, very simplified version on the screen right now, uh, which enhances access to community programs and adds in uh, direct access to one-on-one -on -one services. After having uh, many conversations with the residents and older adults we work with, as well as our system partners, um, we implemented, and this is very, there's a lot of nuances here, which I really wish I had time to talk about, but I don't. <clears throat> we implemented a full-time coordinator uh, who provides on-site presence, establishes a trusting relationship with the older adults, and essentially becomes the ears of the older adults and a conduit to an array of services um, and essentially becomes the one person that that resident or older adult reaches out to. So for, for those that are healthy, this is all that might be required to help them stay healthy in their own home. And at times they may require more, they may require more support um, from, from another member of our team. So in those cases, the coordinator will refer to the integrated care lead or ICL. And the ICL using a values-based assessment tool um, <clears throat> connects the resident to and uh, creates, sorry, creates an individualized care plan for the resident that addresses their specific needs, not just clinical but social needs as well. Any determinant of health-related uh, concern that the resident may have. Once the team is assembled, the ICL becomes the coordinator, 
the navigator, the advocator, and in fact, the translator for the older adult between the care team that's created and the older adult and the older adult to the care team. So they don't replace coordinators and navigators that we're all familiar with. They, they become basically the quarterback of the team that's created. Uh, further support is through our connected care nurse practitioner. So the NP acts as a clinical resource for the integrated care leads, the ICL, and also is able to provide MRPR support uh, via you know, ordering diagnostic tests, lab work, and so on. And the other piece, uh, which is also one of the nuances I'd love to talk about, is an escalation of care pathway. Many integrated care programs uh, possibly don't put a lot of emphasis on that, but as one of our colleagues today mentioned, when the regular care team's not available, people will typically turn around and call 911. So we have developed a very robust EOC pathways to try to prevent avoidable ED visits. Um, so I'm a minute and 15 seconds over, and I apologize because my allergies are horrible, <laughs> otherwise I'd be quicker. Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for spending the time here. Um, just to wrap up, I just want to uh, highlight that each of our models, the ambassador or the more elaborate one that you just saw, uh, is based on prevention, promotion, and early detection, and trying to keep people as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So in the lower intensity ambassador model, you saw the health clinics and some group activities that are kind of the focus of that model, and then we add in the additional layer of access to one-on-one -on -one services when required. So common to all of the models is a relational care approach, and the ambassador program is founded on that approach. Uh, which focuses on the whole person using a values-based philosophy and, and uh, dispelling ageism and prejudice from ageism, and focus on integrating services, not duplicating services, uh, through a one-team approach where the ICL kind of becomes the hub for that regular care team. Um, and now we're lucky to be supported by a dedicated uh, implementation science and improvement team through Women's College through a separate grant. Um, and with the team, our goal is to explore fit in a variety of communities uh, and a diversity of socioeconomic uh, environments to understand what are, um, what are the contextual factors that will lead to a sustainable model in the future and understand what level of support is actually needed and then finally, to look at health system utilization as well and to, 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 to show whether or not we're able to reduce health, health system utilization. Um, that's it for me. Uh, just a quick, uh, quick uh, statement from one of our ambassadors, which really sums it up, as you can see up here on the screen. Um, ran out of time, so you can read it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and my voice. So I think we have about a minute or so for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Joe Thank you. and Jen. Uh, we have a few minutes, a couple minutes for questions. This one. Thank you. Yes, it's working. Great. Um, this really excites me and um, would love to do something very similar back home in the UK, north of England. I guess the question I've got, because having been to Toronto a few times, obviously very apartment, high rises, condos, etc. Uh, very different to what I've got back home in Manchester in North England. So do you think this approach could be adapted and applied to more spread out diverse communities in kind of houses and homes? Because I'm just seeing a lot of our communities where families are trying to look after their loved ones. They're not seen as their informal carers. They're seen as they're a loved one, they're a family member. But actually, this kind of model could help them as, a, a, as somebody who's looked after, but also a carer, and also those that are independently living alone. So do you think it could be kind of applied in that approach? 
Sure. I, absolutely. It's funny. This is the first question that always gets asked. Um, I, yeah, I think absolutely. You know, we chose to focus on vertical NORCs as a starting point because of the trends that we were seeing. Uh, but inevitably, uh, people from rural communities are approaching us because of younger people leaving, services being further apart and whatnot. And, you know, I think it's something that our team is seriously considering, you know, as you can see, we're in a learning phase of our work uh, as, as looking at a rural community and seeing how and where our, our models and approaches can be adapted. And I think, you know, first and foremost, you know, we're looking at this relational approach to working with communities, a caring communities approach uh, that has a whole curriculum to it that could definitely be translated into rural settings, uh, as well as looking at, you know, supporting how do you integrate services. So I absolutely think it's possible and possibly where we're going next. It'd be great to link in. I should also mention part of our learning phase of this work is to build out a toolkit for implementation. So uh, that is something that is our goal as part of the North Innovation Center is to, to try something, adapt it in different contexts and see can we create something that can be useful more broadly. Okay, I think we're out of time for questions, but thanks again for your wonderful presentation and your interesting Thank work. You. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so our next presenter is Anne-Marie Valberg, and she's going to be speaking on improving goal setting and achieving in geriatric rehabilitation through participatory action research. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, just press the green button. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very grateful that the International Conference on Integrated Care gave me the opportunity to tell you about the participatory action research project we undertook and to see you all here. I'm a nursing teacher and researcher in Amsterdam at Hogeschool in Holland. And as a PhD student, I'm conduct conducting research on a geriatric rehabilitation ward. The research question The research question I'm striving to answer is how does the nursing team of a geriatric rehabilitation ward succeed in improving client-centered goal setting and achieving following the steps of a participatory action research Firstly I will briefly tell you something about about participatory action research in general and some specifics of this project. In sh participatory action research, it's social re research carried out by a team that, that includes a professional researcher and the members of an organization, community or network, in my case, nurses. We're seeking to improve the situation the method provides opportunities for co-developing and it's with people rather than for people or about people. Participatory action research follows the steps of an improvement cycle. The participants in the project were the team on the, on the ward of the geriatric rehabilitation ward consisting of 15 vocational trained nurses and healthcare assistants, eight nursing students and a team lead. Me as a facilitator, I was present on the ward once a week in the role of lecturer practitioner. And we formed a core work group in which two to three senior nurses participated, the team lead and myself. The data we as a team collected consisted of amongst others, my field notes, pictures and reports of team sessions, interviews with nurses of the team, student notes on patient interviews, and student observations. Today, I attended two very interesting sessions about participatory action research and the extent to which we succeed in fundamentally involving participants and letting it be their project was a central question in these sessions. And I invite, I invite you all to listen to my story with this point of concern in your mind. 
Okay, I'm now going to talk you through the steps of the participatory action research process. process. Okay, the first step we undertook. Um, the subject that was chosen was goal setting and achieving. Working with rehabilitation goals is seen as an important means to achieve patient-centered care. This broader subject was chosen by the nursing professor and the manager of the nursing home before the start of the project. So um, for the facilitator and the team to familiarize with each other and with the subject and to discover what the team would like to work on, an intensive period of reflection was initiated. Every Wednesday, we took the time to work on answering the core question uh, in supporting patients. How, how do we succeed as a team in supporting patients in working on rehabilitation goals? Several sources of knowledge, knowledge were used. We, ref, we, we reflected about patient cases, we used theoretic models as a lens through which to reflect on our practice, on their practice. We talked to patients to get to know what they need as it comes to working on goals, etc. So this core question was, we tried to answer was, oh, nay. So the core so the core question we tried to answer was, supporting patients in working on rehabilitation goals, how do we succeed as a team? And moving to the diagnosis step, what do we need to do this better? Now, the, team, uh, the nursing team identified two themes influencing their goal work with patients. They said, our continuity of care is suboptimal. We should all work on the same goals to prevent the patient from, from getting confused. And they said patients could be better involved in and informed about their rehabilitation path. So they decided to work on better preparation of the multidisciplinary meeting by preparing it with the patient and at the same time updating the patient record to advance continuity of care by writing a short summary on the state of the rehabilitation goals. Next step was the development phase. Students studied the process of preparation of the multidisciplinary meeting with the patient. They searched for literature, they interviewed the nurses about their work procedures as it comes to preparing that multidisciplinary team meeting and they observed them and out of the literature, the interviews, the observations, they constructed the seven step working procedure constantly asking feedback from the nurses. Uh, nee, no. The action phase. In the action phase, the team started to work via those seven steps. And in order to test and implement the seven step method, I as a teacher together with the team lead and the core work group, we created an assignment for the next group of students each student had to learn to prepare the multidisciplinary meeting. To, through this, we ensured that new students would automatically be introduced to the working procedure, the nurses made sure they knew the procedure, and the activity would be a constant topic of conversation. The evaluation phase. We, we undertook several actions to monitor the progress and the experiences. Weekly, we counted the, prep, prep, the amount of preparational reports. We evaluated the experiences. We asked other disciplines to give an opinion on the new way of working. The quality of the nursing reports was evaluated by the nurses, and patients were interviewed about the preparational talks. What we learned. In brief, the evaluation taught us the following three lessons. A high rate of preparation was achieved and still is after two years. And as a result of the project, nurses felt more responsible and capable to contribute to the multidisciplinary meeting. More and more, they play an, an integrating role in that meeting. Subsequently, they developed an opinion about quality and started to see what was needed. This resulted in 
for example, formulating writing instructions for the nursing report. And it also resulted in a new project on adding specific nursing concerns to the re rehabilitation plan, like independent handling of medication by the patient. When it comes to involving patients in the, in the preparational talk, we, they met a number of barriers. Lack of time to sit down and prepare this multidisciplinary meeting with the patient. Um, not all patients are cognitively fit enough to participate in these talks. Language barriers frequently hinder patient involvement and not all patients talk easily about what hinders them personally in their rehabilitation. There might be a cultural aspect there. In Dutch we call it people have difficulty airing out their dirty laundry. Because of these barriers, nurses sometimes lost the trust or confidence that there definitely are patients who can be involved and that they should keep on trying. Because of the doubts about the benefits of prefer preparing the multidisciplinary meeting with the patient, but still wanting to involve patients as good as possible in their rehabilitation process, the team decided to start a project on working with smaller goals written on the whiteboard in the patient's room. Um, I'm, nearing the conclu I'm nearing the end of my talk. To save time, I kept my, nee, new COVID. kept my conclusion very short. Participatory action research, which involves nurses, can be seen as advantages for facilitating change and improving services. And I finally want to sh like to share three discussion points with you. Facilitation of participation of the nursing of the nurses is crucial for success. Facilitation through giving nurses time to sit down and reflect on their work. Facilitation through stimulating a learning culture, go try things, make mistakes. Facilitation through earmarking time for nurses to work on quality projects. The first two conditions were met, time and the learning culture. The last was not. This meant that the development of the seven-step model was done by the students. And this is a risk when it comes to implementation, I think. In this organization, the structure for working on quality did not include nurses. This means that time for quality is not earmarked, that nurses are not challenged on a structural basis to improve their work. And because patient care is always given priority by professionals who from their heart choose to care, in my opinion, we should organize this better. But for now, it takes us too far to go on about this. Uh, the second point in my discussion is that by choosing a topic that closely matches what is expected of the team, everyone, part all the nurses participated very well, especially regarding the aspect of continuity of care. There was a shared sense of this is a natural part of our work, let's do it. This added to the success of the implementation, but the critical note can be we only worked on putting basic quality in order. We didn't really innovate. The last point in my discussion is that pace was a central issue. Nurses want to move fast. Let's start tomorrow. Let's solve this problem. Um, I understood that and also see the need of, of keeping up with their pace to, to as a facilitator, uh, stay connected with them. As a researcher, uh, I strive for a certain quality of data and, and, and analysis of data, and that did not always match. All in all, I look back on a very inspiring research project, and I would like to thank you all for listening to me. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Over here. Hi, uh, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, I really enjoyed uh, seeing the full circle that you went through, so thank you for that. Um, but you talk about setting and reaching uh, rehabilitation goals and uh, 
also evaluating and preparing the multidisciplinary meeting. And I was wondering why you only focused on nurses and not on other professions which are also involved in reaching and setting these goals, especially in, an, in a geriatric rehabilitation facility. Uh, there's a few reasons uh, of which COVID was one. Um, only six weeks after the project started, um, uh, the pandemic started, and I was, uh, I, uh, may, you might have seen the picture, uh, that whole, um, um, the first phase, that whole um, diagnostic phase, orient, orientate, I stood for the wind, outside the window and talk to the nurses. And there was, there was a, a problem of uh, involving the others. Mm -hmm. um, and in this specific team, um, um, the nurses wanted, yeah, bef um, before being able to play that role in the, in the multidisciplinary setting, they wanted to sort of strengthen their own role. So I, I, we're now actually setting a next Step, uh, doing a next step. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. I was wondering um, can we use the seven steps or this method also in the hospital for a multidisciplinary team meeting in uh, a geriatric? Ward because there's also we are also have struggling with who's taking the lead and what kind of goals and it's almost about how are we getting the patient as quickly as possible out of the hospital. So is this something that we can use in other settings? Uh, yes, I'm. Um, yeah, I think so. It's it's uh, it, the seven steps are divided into two parts. Very simple actually. The first is is, is uh, as a nurse. Um, uh, what are the goals? Read back in the report. What's the what's the stand van zaken? What's the state of the art of the patient's rehabilitation process? And then go to the patient and talk talk about what you've read, what what your observations are, and, and what the patient's ideas of what is needed to go back home. So it's it's very down to earth actually, yeah. And okay. and and. Um, um, no, yeah, fitting on their work procedure, so you might have to adapt it to the to the specific work procedure in the hospital about with using reports and who reports. Okay, yeah. thank you again, Anne Marie. <laughs> okay, so our last presenter for this session is I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. Zoo, is it? Yeah. Zoo? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Thank you, Lee? Maureen. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, I think I'm the last speaker. Thank you for staying back. I stand between you and your uh, conference dinner. I try to catch up some time. Okay, my name is Shi. I'm the senior nurse clinician from Singapore General Hospital Community Nursing. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so today my presentation is about uh, influenza vaccinations that I think previous, um, many countries has been trying to work on. Okay, um, so this is the outline. Okay, just a brief uh, intro about the Singapore. Um, it's the island countries from Southeast Asia. Our official language are English, Malay, Mandarin, and Tamil. 78% um, of our residents resided at HDB flights under public housing. And we have a population of 5.6 million. So it's a, uh, it's a small country. <laughs> As um, previously, Dr. Ko uh, Colin has shared during their plenary conference um, that um, Singapore is really facing the critical issues of aging populations um, in view of our high um, life expectancies as well as uh, low fertility rate. Um, Singapore healthcare systems is really facing the high prevalence of um, uh, patient uh, residents with uh, chronic diseases. So just a brief intro of the Singapore public healthcare systems. Um, we, um, the uh, uh, public health care system is anchored by the three clusters on uh, National University Health, si uh, health uh, Sing Systems, National Health uh, Healthcare Groups, as well as SingHealth. 
So Singapore General Hospitals, as one of the Sing Health institutions, is responsible to anchor the population health at the southeast region. So um, just do a bit of advertisement of the Singapore General Hospital. It's a hospital with more than 200 years of um, histories. It's the largest acute tertiary hospital in Singapore. It's also a leading teaching hospital in collaboration with UNUS Graduate Medical School. And this year, we are very happy to um, be ranked as the world best hospitals by Newsweek. Okay, um, back to our studies on the influenza. So as we all know that influenza is a contagious um, viral respiratory infection. Um, WHO already estimated three to five million of cases with severe influenza with 290,000 to 650,000 of deaths annually. Our older adults, um, especially those with chronic diseases, definitely is at a higher risk of uh, getting influenza and uh, its related complications. Then uh, annual influenza vaccinations has been recommended as one of the um, evidence-based and cost-effective interventions. However, in Singapore in 2016, our influenza vaccination rate is remains low, only 14%. That's um, the promoting of the vaccination uptake among our community dwelling older adults is one of the key components under the population health measures. So the aim of our study is to ascertain the social demographics as well as the clinical determinants um, to explore the key factors influencing the vaccination uptake. Uh, as the study co was conducted during the pandemic, we would also like to explore the impact of COVID-19 on vaccine uptake among these group of populations. So um, we have conducted the mixed method studies that comprise surveys as well as semi-structured interviews between September um, September 2020 and uh, July 2021. Um, we have recruited 235 participants um, based on the 14% uptake rate as well as 20% drop rate. We did the re block randomizations um, of uh, 47 from each community or care zones. Um, the inclusion criteria are the older adults uh, who are 65 and above from our 27 community nurse posts across the five community or care zones. Those um, who are cognitively impaired or are able to read, write, or converse in basic English was excluded from the study. So um, the survey design is based on the um, uh, local studies on the influenza vaccination as well as it primarily grounded on the health belief model. Um, we have the prototype questions um, are revealed by our study members who are experts in the family medicines, public health, as well as community nursing teams. Um, the questionnaire consists of basically social, dem um, social demographic characteristics, uh, health conditions, vaccination status, the attitude, their attitude towards the vaccinations, um, their willingness whether to pay for the vaccinations, and their intention for the future vaccinations. We also explore their preferred vac vaccine sites as well as the source of information they get the um, uh, the, uh, they get from. So data analyzed was based on the descriptive statistics, chi-square, as well as uh, um, log logistic regressions. Um, for the interview questions, uh, actually it's developed based on the two earlier studies to explore the experience with the influenza vaccination as well as um, the factors that motivating as well as discouraging them for getting the vaccinations. We added in the additional questions to explore the, how the COVID-19 has really in, impact on their decisions. Um, we conducted eight individual face-to-face -face interviews as well as 12 telephonic interviews in view of the restrictions during the pandemic. Um, data saturation was achieved at the 20th interview and all interviews was audio recorded and uh, um, analyzed based on the thematic analysis. Okay, I'll just skip these. All right, so this is uh, our survey results. So majority were females, Chinese and aged um, 75 and above, they are really uh, in the uh, very senior groups. And the most, uh, most of them are lived with others or, and they were also not working. Approximately two thirds had no formal educations or attained only primary educations. Um, half of our participants indicate that they had two or more um, comorbidities and the most had their regular family doctors and of um, physicians they went for the medical treatments. Um, in our studies, 39% actually received the vaccination in their past 12 months, but we still have 12% unsure of the influenza vaccination status. Among those unvaccinated, 24.8% are not even heard of the influenza vaccinations. 
So um, our um, survey findings shows that the living arrangement was identified as a significant contributing factor towards the vaccine uptake. And the participants who live alone were 2.5 times more likely to be vaccinated than those living with others. I will explain it later. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so these are some of the survey questions we're asking about them on the perceptions towards the vaccine. So you can see from here that majority felt that um, it is important to get the vaccinations and they felt that influenza is, has a potential risk uh, illness and it is important for the older adults as well as those with chronic conditions. However, we still have more than 50%, 68% felt that it's only important to receive vaccinations when they go overseas trip. And then even only less than half felt that they are at risk of getting influenza infections despite the so, uh, high, so senior age. Okay, so the, uh, we also asked them the, about the intention for the future vaccinations. So key enablers mainly is to avoid to getting the infected, avoid to get transmitted to others, and they receive the um, advice from healthcare professionals. Um, but the key barrier is they really, really concerns about the possible side effect, the effectiveness. As, uh, also, we have uh, more, less than half, about 48% felt that they don't even have enough information about the vaccinations. Um, uh, more than 58, 55% they are willing to pay, okay, uh, at the Euro 24 dollars, <laughs> and the 75.7 willing to get vaccinated, but if it's only uh, covered by the national health uh, uh, saving subsidies. And the preferred vaccination sites is mainly a polyclinic, uh, is our primary care facilities, community spaces, if there's a vaccine drives, also uh, from their uh, GPs or family clinics. Um, the most preferred source of information, again, is from healthcare professionals, but some also receive the information from the media. So um, for the interviews, we have generated five teams. So the first is about the perceived importance of vaccinations. Um, they felt they wanted to defend their me uh, health mechanism to uh, defend, protect themselves. So I um, also wanted to take more strong precautions to reduce the transmission to others. So the second team is about the um, sphere of influence. Um, they get the adequate prompters from their significant others, such as their nurses, doctors, their family members, or also friends or peers. But they also felt that um, the community engagement programs, such as the health talks and all this, is helped to raise their awareness. So the third team is about the healthcare schemes and the medical subsidies. And uh, we have the participants mentioned that the medical subsidies really help them and uh, they felt that the cost is more affordable and they can use their medicine to deduct. That is why the reason they went for vaccinations. Um, the fourth team is about the psychological impediments. Um, uh, okay, um, they felt that they did not have the jet because they were well at the times and they felt that it's only important to receive the jet when they go overseas. So the next is about the perceived low priorities uh, because they felt that no, uh, there's no in urgency to receive the influenza vaccination, especially when the government is keep on promoting the COVID-19 vaccination while the influenza was not really <laughs> being advocated um, yeah, widely. And a lot of seniors had the issues. They felt that the one jab is enough. So after the COVID-19 vaccinations, they did not go for these influenza vaccinations. They thought they are the same, give them the same protections. Yeah, so the um, next is about the fear of side effect, okay? Be especially to those living alone, lack of caregivers. Um, they're really concerned that if they um, uh, get any side effect from the vaccinations, um, nobody is able to take care of them. Um, the last team is about inconsistent emphasis at the various touch points. Um, we have the participants went for the um, clinic to see the doctor. They mentioned that they did not receive any information from the healthcare professionals and the, they was, um, the vaccination was not really recommended to them. Um, so based on all these findings, um, we know that uh, influenza prevails as a, a public health threat and yet our vaccination rate was remained relatively low among our older adults. And uh, we know that living arrangement really significantly associated with the vaccine uptake. 
um, participants living alone were more likely to get vaccinated. The reason here we explore likely is due to the close follow-up and visits by either community nurses or the community agencies for those uh, uh, for social connectedness. Um, a a spear of influence from the family, friends, and the peers and health workers really emerged as a double agent sword to either motivate or discourage our participants from getting vaccinations. There are still of issues of uh, knowledge insufficiencies and inconsistent emphasis by various healthcare workers at different touch points across the uh, healthcare settings as well as in the communities. And the majority of uh, participants viewed as avoidance of getting infected as an enabler and acknowledge the importance. However, we still have less than half felt that they are they uh, perceive that they are at the risk. So um, we really have wanted to advocate more public education to this population at risk. Um, there's still mistrust and the suspicion um, towards the quality and the effectiveness of the vaccines, probably also correlated with the COVID vaccinations. Um, so they were still the predominant barriers to improve the vaccine uptake. Um, so, uh, as what we mentioned, healthcare workers, we still need to step up and actively listen to our older adults' their concerns and uh, try to dispel their di misinformation to boost their confidence. And uh, we recommend a standardized screening and referral process for vaccines in the different uh, healthcare settings. And uh, we want to provide the accessible community healthcare services that are comprising the individual coaching, health talks, as well as on site vaccine drives really to help to strengthen the support for our larger populations or older adults with various living arrangements. So um, because our uh, res participants uh, mainly are resided within the Southeast region of Singapore and generally are from low socioeconomic status and the education level, thus it may limit our uh, generalizability of our study findings. Nevertheless, our findings will still benefit our future population health initiative targeting on these vulnerable populations. Um, uh, we understand the individual and the telephonic interviews definitely narrow our scope of our discussions. Um, as such, we had uh, built on the um, subsequent interviews to ensure data saturation is uh, saturated. So in conclusion, we believe that the multifactorial influence um, influences underpin our participants' decision to vaccinate. Um, for implication for future research, we plan to conduct the longitudinal population-based um, interventions that comprises vaccine drive, standard referral process, system reminder, as well as health talks to evaluate the entire effectiveness of these multi-component vaccine programs. And for healthcare workers, uh, we want to emphasize that the greater community and the public health efforts are needed to reach out to this group of populations. And uh, um, healthcare workers from hospital to community need to provide more targeted information to address and alleviate their concerns. This is especially during the pandemic to encourage the vaccine uptake. Okay, this is my reference. Uh, this study was funded by the Sing Health uh, Regional Health System Pulse Center Grant. I would like to acknowledge that. Yeah, so I also would like to thank my nurses who helped to collect the data, as well as uh, um, my team members, research members, as well as the uh, Singapore General Hospital, the nursing research uh, departments. Okay. Um, this uh, study has recently published under the Graduate Nursing. Yeah, you can. It's open access. You can download <laughs> if you're interested. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, open to any questions. No, I think we're pretty much out of time. Yeah. But um, I'm, if there's one burning question, we can take that. Otherwise, thank you very much. Okay. And thank thanks you. to all the presenters and to all of you.